Okay. So we are uh, working on daily quiz number 13 for attendance. Uh, the date today is Friday, March 12th. In terms of what is due uh, for homework and studio, homework 7 is due uh, the coming Tuesday, March 16th. I will be posting homework 8 early next week so that you guys can start working on that. Uh, studio 4 is due March 17th. So that's the Wednesday that's coming up next week uh, for which you require both the TA checkoff as well as a report submission on Gradescope. Studio 5, uh, which will essentially be based on decoders and encoders, uh, I will be posting that early next week as well, um, maybe over the weekend too, uh, so that you can get started on uh, the Sunday. Uh, it will be due March 31st. So you have a bit of time uh, to work on Studio 5. And the main reason for that kind of a time uh, a timeline is because the Studio 5 is going to have three separate tasks. Um, so you can uh, balance your time out. Uh, so to, you work on task 1, then 2, and then 3. Um, it the, the checkoff process also takes a bit of time for studio 5 uh, so I would really encourage you guys to start early uh, and as you are uh, getting through your studio tasks get them checked off early uh, so that at the last minute there is it doesn't become a bottleneck all right let's talk continue talking about encoders. So this is what we did last class where we started, we finished talking about decoders, then we started talking about encoders. The first difference was in terms of decoders and encoders, uh, things were sort of the opposite. So in decoders, you had n to two raised to n, meaning n inputs and two raised to n outputs. For the encoder, it was different. It was exactly the opposite, two raised to n inputs and n outputs. Uh, that was the case of the binary or basic encoder or the priority encoder, the two common forms in which you uh, find an encoder. Now, the, the good thing about the decoder is that the designer was able to uh, guarantee that only one output is active at any given time for any input sequence. However, for an encoder, uh, because now the limitation is for the input, only one input can be active at any given time. So the user of the encoder has to take the responsibility of, of making sure that only one input is active. Um, which means that if the user is wrong, uh, we need to have some sort of a, a plan B, some sort of a backup option to only count one of those inputs as opposed to more than one inputs. So we establish priority. And the way uh, commonly priority is implemented is by the most significant active input being counted. So we looked at the basic encoder first, we looked at the smallest size, four inputs, two outputs, we looked at everything being active high, it was the case where we assumed that things were enabled, we looked at four inputs, i0, i1, i2, i3, and we looked at the two corresponding basic encoder or binary encoder outputs in y1 and y0. And the subscripts over here, 3, 2, 1, 0, uh, give the uh, significance, right? So everything is active high, and i3 is the most significant input, i0 is the least significant input, and the same thing applies even for the outputs, in that y1 is the most significant output. So as you have one of these inputs active at any given time, you will encode that situation into 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 1, 1. And then based on the true table, we were able to write equations for the two outputs in terms of the four inputs. And what we saw here is for the basic encoder, uh, the least significant input i0 was not appearing in any of the logic functions, which means that the output was not dependent on i0. i0 was simply not connected to anything uh, inside that basic encoder. Not the case for the priority encoder. Then based on, the, on those equations, we were able to uh, quickly sketch up a logic diagram relating eight inputs in this case. We just increased the size from four to two to eight to three, but we are still looking at the binary or the basic encoder. Uh, eight inputs corresponding to three outputs and the relationships are exactly the same, just uh, you know a bigger size. 
So y0 is the sum of i1, i3, i5, and i7. In the previous case, we just had i1 plus i3. And we did that uh, the same way. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. Can you chain encoders to make larger ones like you can? Absolutely right, Ryan. Uh, we are going to take a look at those ideas. Uh, maybe not with examples, but I'll certainly talk about how you could uh, cascade encoders. Um, but you're on the right track. You can absolutely do that to build bigger encoders. Uh, but you would also have to add some more combinational logic to your uh, circuit. All right. Uh, so that was about the binary encoder. Then we looked at the priority encoder in which we were giving the priority to the most significant active input. So in the first row, I0 was the most significant active input. In the second row, I1 was the most significant active input. In the third row, I2 is the most significant active input. And in the last row, I3 is the most significant active input. So those will be the ones that get counted. The rest of these guys are don't cares. So the way you uh, build a logic diagram for this is by first writing row expressions. And we are writing row expressions using the letter H, one for row zero, row one, row two, row three. And based on this, we looked at Y zero. Y zero was a one here and here. So that's row one and row three. We wrote the expression for that. And similarly, we wrote that for y1 as well. Again, we are assuming that everything is enabled and everything in terms of uh, inputs and outputs is active high. We looked at a, a real world application in which you could have a re request encoder where several, uh, several people are requesting for service and based on which person is requesting for service, you would encode their request into a number form. So for example, if request three uh, is active, you would encode that into a uh, 011 sequence and that would be the requester's number. This is the, the, the last slide we were talking about last class where we have a eight input priority encoder. So all these inputs over here are active high inputs I0 all the way through I7. Clearly, I7 is the most significant input. I0 is the least significant input. Um, and it has three outputs, all of them active high. It also has one special output called idle, which is active high, but it essentially monitors whether you got something or not on at least one of the inputs, right? Uh, and if you didn't, then idle would be uh, inactive or zero in this case. So just the same way as we wrote row expressions for the four to two priority encoder, we were able to expand that into a bigger size for eight to three priority encoder and be able to write these row expressions. After we wrote those expressions, we were able to uh, write the expression for the three active high outputs. A zero alternates. A1 goes two zeros, two ones, two zeros, two ones, and then A2 goes four zeros and then four ones. And then idle is some uh, really monitoring whether any one of these things is true or not. So you are all the inputs and then you complement the entire thing, which by using De Morgan's law, you can also represent using this way, right? So over here, everything active high, eight inputs, three outputs, one special output in terms of idle, which tells you whether you got something or not. But this is not a standard priority encoder. The standard in a chip, uh, which a uh, uh, priority encoder is the 74X148 chip. Uh, so idle is active low. No, idle is uh, still active high, right? Uh, let's see, this or this or this. Uh, if you get many of, oh, you're right. Idle is active low. You're right. So if any one of them is a one, you would actually get a zero. You're right. Now let's take a look at the 74X148 chip. Uh, on the left, we have the priority encoder from the previous slide. We are uh, 
changing a few things to get the standard chip version, which is the 74X148. Uh, we have one active low enable. So that's your active low enable here. Active low enable, only one of them. Then we have eight active low inputs. eight active low inputs and the numbering scheme gives the significance and then we have three active low outputs and then we also have two special outputs uh, got something output is actually similar to the idle output uh, which is going to tell you, it's an active low output, which is going to tell you if one of these inputs is true or not. Um, so you have two of these special ones. So got something over there, active low, and enable output, which is also an active low output. Uh, and these two outputs are essentially used in cascading. So the, the point that uh, Ryan made earlier was about cascading and begin building bigger encoders. And you can do that by uh, creatively using these two outputs. So used in, used in cascading encoders. These two guys. Now let's talk about uh, how the truth table would look like. Uh, for, for the standard chip uh, because I want to uh, spend some time talking about the uh, how these two outputs are different because they are very similar. So your inputs are over here. Let me highlight them in the same colors over here, maybe yellow. All right, so your inputs are over here, all active low and just be careful. We are writing the most significant output input here and the least significant over here. MS, most significant, LS, least significant. Um, let's try to identify where are these guys active. So, well, before we do that, let's talk about the first column here, the, the first row. In the first row, enable is active low. Oh, it's just uh, no special reason. Uh, this is how it was laid out in the textbook, uh, but nothing really would be different uh, if um, we had the most significant uh, on the on the on the leftmost column, right? So we would have to adjust our outputs depending on that, but th no 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 special reason. All right, so enable input is active low. It is one for the first row, which essentially means the encoder is disabled. If it is disabled, then no matter what you get on the inputs, you are going to encode that as all outputs are inactive. You didn't get anything. And uh, don't enable the uh, enable output. Right? So that's when uh, the chip is disabled. But for the remaining cases, it is enabled, right? So all of these, the chip is enabled, actually even the last one. All of those are when the chip is enabled. Now in this case, if i7 is active, zero, it would encode that as all the outputs being active, zero, zero, zero. Remember, these are active low outputs. You did get something. GS is GS underscore L is active, but I'm not enabling the output, right? So think about think about this uh, in, in in this context. Uh, let me add a page here after blank. Okay. So suppose you had uh, encoders, right? So you had a eight to three encoder over here, and you had to kind of daisy chain it or cascade it along with another eight to three encoder. So this guy would have an enable input 
an active low enable input and this would have a any active low enable output so what you could do is you could use that enable output to connect to the enable input of the next chip so that you can go from 8 to 3 encoder to perhaps a, a 16 to 4 encoder. Now you have to be careful here because there are three outputs here, there are three outputs here. You would have to run them through another combinational logic to eventually get to four outputs out of the six available. But that's exactly how you would daisy chain the enable output signal to cascade encoders. So this would be enable input E I underscore L. This would be E O underscore L, which will be connected to the next enable input. That's, that's the sort of the purpose of that, right? So when you are operating the first chip, it is enabled and you got something you don't want that to enable the second the the second uh, from the top chip so enable act output is uh, actually inactive now you're not enabling the next one now th that kind of pattern keeps going uh, until you hit the last row let's try to track the priority and the inputs now as when you go to the next stage where i6 is the most significant active input you encode that as uh, 0, 0, 1. In other words, if you were looking at it in terms of active high levels, it would be 1, 1 and a 0. That's your 6. You did get something. Don't enable the next chip. Because this one is operational. And then as this goes, keeps going down, you get 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, active here, active here, active here. You will be essentially tracking 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all of them are active low outputs. And for all those cases, you did get something. So got something output is still active. And you don't want the next chip to be enabled for all these cases. So EO underscore L is uh, inactive, a 1. Now when you look at the last case, that's the difference between got something and enable output. For the last case, the chip is still enabled. You did not get any active input because of which you made uh, the got something output inactive because you didn't get anything there. But because the chip was enabled and you didn't get anything for the first chip, you want to activate the next chip, right? So if this guy is not active, then you start looking at the next one. Which is why this guy is one here. So that's sort of the uh, difference between got something and enable output. Uh, and you can think of it in terms of uh, these two statements. Got something output is really used to see whether any one of the inputs to the 148 chip is active or not. Enable output uh, EO output uh, is being used to daisy chain multiple encoders so as to build a bigger encoder. All right, questions about the 74x148 truth table. And once you have the truth table, you know, you can build logic expressions, you can build logic diagrams, you can look at the simplest expression and do all that fun stuff because you have the truth table now. There are um, five outputs, but only three of them are uh, the actual outputs. Got something and enable output are sort of the special outputs uh, that we would be using for cascading purposes. Why would we need the EO into the next level? Uh, couldn't you always have the second chip active uh, because it will only output something if it has any so that's exactly what the, that is checking right so the chip is available the output is already available so we are using it uh, but you're right you could you could make up your own uh, combinational circuit to do that job 
but since this is a standard chip, that output is available to us. Remember, I don't need to just stop at two, right? I can actually keep going down. I can go to uh, go on to build uh, something like a 32 is to five encoder. So it, this this can uh, really become something uh, pretty pretty intense very quickly as you put in more and more encoders together. So if you were to uh, if you were to make a 32 is to five encoder using multiple eight is to three priority encoders, you would actually have to use the got something output and the enable output for your next level combinational circuit. So be because think about this. 32 is to 5 will require 32 inputs and 5 outputs, right? This guy will give you 8 to 3. 8 to 3. So clearly you need two more, right? So if you have two more, then, uh, hold up. You need, right, th two more. So that gives you 32 inputs. But now you have 3 times 4, 12 outputs you would have to run those 12 outputs through another combinational circuit because you eventually want that to be encoded into just five outputs. For that, you would need both the uh, got something as well as the enable output. All right, uh, other questions about the 8 is to 3 standard priority encoder 748-74148 chip. One of the tasks for the studio, Studio 5, will be to make this priority encoder. So for example, you know, um, if you look at the inputs, the switch is off. I don't care what the position is for these switches. The switch is off. The switch is on. The switch is on. The corresponding LEDs. LED should be off. LED should be on. LED should be off. LED should be off. LED should be on. You okay, see that? So you'll be using switches and LEDs uh, for the inputs and outputs uh, for the for the studio. All right, let me move on here. We talked about that. Now let's talk about the next uh, combinational logic design component, which is the three state buffer or the tri-state buffer. Uh, the primary uh, application for that is to be able to tie multiple outputs together. Um, and you know, you, 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 I usually have a lot of fun uh, you know, making exam problems using tri-state buffers, and I'll show you show you uh, where I have my fun. Uh, but let's talk about what this tri-state buffer allows us to do. So far, we have been looking at outputs of any logic function to be either low or be high. We are going to start adding one more type of output that is possible, which is high impedance, which essentially means that my output is a dangling wire. So I have a low that is zero, then I have a high, which is a one, but I also can have a high impedance output, which essentially means that a high Z means high impedance. Sort of a dangling wire. Not connected to anything. This is actually, uh, you know, implemented using a open collector uh, gate, uh, but we don't need to go into the uh, details about that. Let's try to take a look at the symbol and the truth table of a tri-state buffer. And it is called tri-state because it can be either in the low state, high state, or in the high impedance state, three states. You have an input A, you have an output out, and you also have an enable. Now, each of these is a binary variable. So either a one or a zero, 
but the output can be in the high impedance state as well. There's a question in the chat box. Uh, wouldn't a signal that is not connected to anything be zero? Not necessarily. Nope. It would, it's a dangling wire. For, for you to make it into a zero, you would have to ground it. For you to make it into a one, you would have to put it to high, like connect it to high. If it is a dangling wire, then its state is unknown. All right, so let's take a look. I If enable is a binary variable, then this can either be a zero or it can be a one. Now, if it is a zero, then my tri-state buffer is disabled because everything over here is active high, the, the way it is shown over here. Everything is active high. So if enable is zero, what would be my output? My output in that case would actually be uh, not in blue. High impedance. High Z. So if you disable the tri-state buffer by making the enable input zero, then it is like there is a disconnect for the output line. That will put it in the high impedance state. And in that, no, you know, no matter what this is, X, no matter what A is, a zero or a one, the output would be high impedance. So this takes care of zero and this takes care of one, right? That's don't care. Now let's talk about the case where it is enabled. So if you make enable input one, you are enabling the tri-state buffer. And in this case, output will be the same as the input. A goes in, A comes out. You guys see that? So that's your, the, the basic functionality of how a tri-state uh, buffer is supposed to work. We have the truth table by the side, as you can see, for the first two cases, uh, things are disabled, right? And no matter what A is, low or high, the output is in the high impedance state. And for the last two cases, it is enabled. EN uh, signal is high and when it is enabled, low goes to low, high goes to high. In other words, output will equal input A. This can be very helpful in tying multiple outputs together. And I will show you guys examples of how we can do that. There are four different flavors that the tri-state buffers come in. And those are the symbols are shown to you over here. Uh, so the first thing that we'll do is we'll try to uh, call them by their uh, function. So for the first one, all the way to the left, I have an active high enable. And this is not an inverter. It is si simply a buffer, right? because it's not inverting the input. It is taking the input and just solidifying that logic level for the for the output. So it's an active high enable. So this is your enable input output. Active high enable buffer. That's your first one. What would be the next one? So these are called tri-state inverter or buffer. Yes, that's right. So you've got active low enable, but it's a buffer as far as input and output are concerned. Uh, the next one is what? Uh, it's a active I enable, but it's an inverter, not gate. Right? So if A goes in, A complement comes out. And the last one is active low enable uh, and it's an inverter. 
तो एसेंशियली फोर सिचुएशन इन विच एनेबल कैन आइदर बी एक्टिव हाई और एक्टिव लो एंड इट कैन आइदर फंक्शन एज अ बफर और एन इन्वर्टर जस्ट फॉर द सेक ऑफ कंप्लीटनेस लेट एस टेक वन ऑफ दीज एंड ट्राई टू राइट इट्स ट्रुट टेबल बिकॉज दिस हैज अ लिटल बिट मोर सर्कल्स वॉट आई डू इज आई ट्राई टू टेक दिस गाय एंड राइट आउट इट्स ट्रुट टेबल So I have three inputs, right? So I have an active low enable. I have an input called A, and an output underscore L. So four possibilities: low, 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 high, high, low, high, and high. so what do you guys think for the for the first case when when enable underscore l is low a is low what would be out underscore l uh you wouldn't put an x for a yeah i just put both of them sure we can we can we can do that as well i just want to write the all the four possibilities uh hi right hi so if input is low because it's an inverter hi comes up uh what about the next one it is still uh, enabled input is high output would be low and for the last two cases it is disabled and the output will be in the i z state disconnected i z yes you guys see that All right so four different flavors for the tri state Uh, buffer or the tri-state inverter. Okay, now let's try to look at how we can uh, use tri-state buffers to tie multiple outputs together. So as you can see, uh, what what all do we have on this slide? We have a standard seven four x one three eight chip, which is what, which is a three to eight uh, decoder. and then we have a bunch of uh tri state buffers right so let me box that up in maybe bread so all of these guys there are eight of them they are uh what is that eight tri state or three state buffers uh with active low enables uh doesn't it have open collector inside it does so it's a, it's it's made from a open collector design but we are not we are not exploring the internals uh for for this we are just using the abstract version the symbol and the truth table so we have got the 3 to 8 decoder uh the there are eight outputs for a 3 to 8 decoder all of those outputs are actually controlling the enables of the eight tri state buffers and if you see the outputs of all the eight tri state buffers are tied together on a one bit party line which we are calling serial data s data so everything is tied together so clearly you could run into a problem right so you could run into a what could be the problem here So when you are tying multiple outputs together, do you guys see some potential problems here? Uh, without the decoder in mind, zero and one would be a short circuit. Yeah, right. So if one uh, one output is saying zero and the other output is saying one, and you are trying to connect them together, that would be a short circuit between the source and the ground, right? so that would damage the 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 chips the, uh, because you cannot tie a high to a low directly so that is a problem and the way we are accomplishing that it will never happen is by putting a decoder the decoder will make sure that only one tri state buffer is active at any given time 
no matter what you give at the input, it will make sure that only one guy is active. Now you might be wondering what P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, R. So what do you guys think that those are? Uh, let me just uh, write these down here. So, P, Q, R, blah, 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 all the way to W, right? These are arbitrary binary variables uh, or inputs. that want to share or write to the one bit party line so all of these guys want to get access to that s data output but only one of them is going to be able to control uh, what S data actually is. So let's let's try to uh, walk through this um, in this way. I've got three enables for the three to eight decoder. One of them is active high, two of them are active low. So for the sake of discussion, I'm going to assume that it, everything is sort of uh, enabled so I'll connect this to high, I'll connect these two guys to ground, one zero zero. So I've enabled the three to eight decoder. And I have three inputs, A, B, C, A is connected, A is your least significant input, source zero, B is your next most significant, C is the most significant input. So what I'll do is I will uh, highlight, I'll just assign them maybe one one zero, right? So just some one one zero that's your uh, arbitrary assignment for the input now if these are the inputs that are assigned you know that only one output is going to be active so can you guys tell me which pin which output pin is active right now <laughs> okay does the S mean, huh? right, select. Knife says pin number 12 is going to be active. And he's right. Pin number 12 is going to be active because it corresponds to Y3 as the output. And Y3 is going to be active because you have given the input of 0, 1, 1 which is decimal three. So everything is going to be inactive, the inactive, 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 but only one guy, which is Y3, is going to be active. And if you track it down, you see there was a bubble there, there was a bubble there. So an active low output here is an active low input over here. So the two bubbles sort of are canceling out and an active high output here would make that enable active high, which means only this particular buffer is going to be in the non high impedance state. So only this guy is going to be active. But everything else, all the other seven tri-state buffers are actually in the high impedance state which will make them disconnected from the S data line. So that now S data will simply equal S. So whatever S is, it's a binary input variable, right? So whatever S is, 0 or a 1, S data will be 0 or a 1. Let's see, why is it, why is it S? Serial, serial data, serial. Uh, so high impedance is never so high impedance is never a logic one or zero that's right it's never a logic one or zero all right 
Uh, now let's see. What if, what if this was disabled? Let us ask that. Uh, what if this it was disabled? What if seven four x one three eight was disabled? What would be S data? Uh, no data. Okay. Uh, but in terms of low, high, high impedance, or one of the eight inputs variable, it would be high Z, right? So uh, high Z. So S data would be in the high impedance state. So that would mean that this guy itself is not connected to the entire thing. Now, where would that become useful? Well, that could be useful if you are actually kind of making a bigger diagram, right? So for example, if you had eight here, eight here, eight here, multiple of those, then you could deselect a group of eight at once by disabling one of those encoder chips. Uh, now, I, I claimed earlier that uh, uh, I have some fun with this. So let me show you guys what I mean by that. Uh, so what I'll do is I'm going to go to Piazza uh, and then just go to maybe a previous class. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can go here. I can go here. And then maybe I can take a look at some. Um, so this is a back exam for uh, this the second exam. Uh, I will be posting it later on, but uh, I'll show you guys an example problem here so you guys see this it's a pretty pretty uh, big uh, block diagram but in reality is it's, it's uh, pretty simple if you if you if you really kind of uh, go through with all the steps one after the other this becomes uh, pretty simple and fun at the end uh, so instead of having eight uh, tri-state buffers I expanded it to 16 tri-state buffers uh, and instead of going from PQRS all the way to W I, I went from A through G and then O to W for the input variables and instead of having one um, 74x138 I had two of them so essentially I used uh, cascading of decoders and the tri-state buffers those two, I joined them together, right? And what, what did I ask the students to do? I simply asked the students to tell me what S data is going to be, provided I give them the enable underscore L and the four inputs, N3, N2, N1, and N0, right? So essentially I said, I will tell you guys what the inputs are, enable N3, N2, N1, N0, and then you got to tell me what S data is going to be. And I did that to uh, spell something out. Uh, is this, is there a high impedance state in VHDL? Yes, absolutely there is. There is a high impedance a a a state everywhere, right? So uh, this was from a couple of years ago, uh, but you know, a lot of the students, they were taking this exam in person. And as soon as they got the correct answer, they they looked at me and smiled <laughs> yeah facebook would be a good one uh, as well but what hurt me <laughs> the most was a student getting something like this c o r r b c t <laughs> and then they would move on uh, and kind of you know not look at the <laughs> answer completely um, and you know this is this is sort of a way okay what was your answer for that it was correct how do you know it was correct so i had some fun with that um, I, and i think the students enjoyed it as well all right enough of that let's come back to what we are talking about today okay now questions about this <laughs> it wasn't correct <laughs>
All right, you guys. Do you guys see it? Um, how this could be useful in tying multiple signals together, multiple outputs together. All right. Now let's try to take a look at some standard chips in which you have these tri-state buffers uh, for a bus. What do you mean? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would you would be doing this for uh, multiple. Uh, you know, it it can be useful in uh, attaching not just one bit to one thing. Uh, suppose you are trying to uh, connect uh, sixty four bits output to another sixty four bit output to another sixty. It applies the same way, right? So you are essentially going to put all the 64 outputs in high impedance to disconnect everything except for one. Absolutely works. That's exactly what, what you would do to, to tie multiple of those together. All right, so let's take a look at some uh, tri-state drivers or tri-state buffers in their standard chips. So this is 74X541. Uh, Two active low enables. Excuse me. Two active low enables. Then we have, uh, let's see, eight active high inputs, eight active high outputs. These, this is sort of the internal logic diagram that goes for the 74X541. So let's suppose, um, what, let's see what happens here. If I enable it, which means that I would have to connect this to zero, this to zero, if I enable it, then this guy becomes one, this guy becomes one, and then the output of the AND gate would be a one, which will essentially put all these uh, tri-state buffers, which are following a Schmidt trigger uh, Schmidt trigger process, right? So that, that means that they are corresponding to two thresholds as opposed to one threshold, the lower one and the upper one. Uh, so everything is enabled. And if everything is enabled, what would be Y1? A1, right. Uh, what what about y2 what would what would be y2 y2 would be a2 okay so now i can say y sub k will equal a sub k where k is uh, k belongs to uh, 1 2 blah 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 8 This happens when it is enabled, right? When enabled, this happens. How about when disabled? When disabled, yk would equal what? iz, that's right. So now we can, you know, talk about the uh, application that Andrew was pointing out for a bus, you could actually take this multiple of these to tie them together, right? So for example, you could do something like this. Uh, you can have one chip here, one chip here, one chip here, one chip here. Oh my gosh. Um, and then you can use a eight bit line and you can connect all of these guys together. So each one of these is going to be a 74541 chip and all of these are sort of 8 bit output all the Y's they have a 8 bit input here but now you can use this to tie multiple 
eight bit outputs together on an eight bit bus. Uh, let's see, do they make two it? Andrew, are you looking at uh, uh, slides ahead? <laughs> Yes, we have a two-way transceiver. We just hold on. Yes, that's exactly what's going to follow. So this way, you not only have the option of connecting multiple one-bit outputs together, you can also do that for uh, eight-bit bus. So for a, for a bus as well. Uh, so we we talked about when it is enabled. When it when we talked about when it is disabled. YK, all right, everything is good. It has two enables, uh, which should help in cascading things. Whenever you see multi more than one enable, right? So you can you can uh, kind of that hints towards the fact that you can use uh, multiple inputs to cascade uh, more than one chip. <laughs> all right, so now let's talk about how we can actually uh, apply uh, w one of the applications of this 74X541 chip. So we have a microprocessor over here that is trying to read from one of the user input ports, right? So it could this could be a printer, it could be whatever you want. Like it, what it is trying to read uh, from one of the ports and we are labeling them input port number one and input port number two. So we are trying to input, we are trying to read, uh, wait a second, hold on. I post them way ahead of lecture. All right, so in case, in case you guys didn't, uh, were not aware, I post lecture notes uh, ahead of time so that uh, you if, if you have a iPad for example or a, a notebook you could actually take notes on the slides uh, yeah I have a before lecture and after lecture section all right so let's come back to this I'm trying to read from one of the input ports either input port 1 or input port 2 where am I trying to read that data I'm trying to read it into a microprocessor so there are two sets of user inputs the first set of user inputs is an input to the top 74x541 chip and uh, another set of eight inputs that become the user inputs for the bottom one now the question is uh, can I uh, give out some control signals from the microprocessor to read from the user uh, input port 1 or user uh, input port 2 right so let's suppose I want to read right so if I want to read obviously I have to make the read signal active how do I make that active well you just uh, make it zero I have not been paying attention to the uh, chat box, you guys. Hold up. How is this news to you guys? Yes, I have a bef Okay, so this is lecture six. Yeah, this is almost at the end of lecture six. Yes. Well, what do we do when it ends? Uh, what do we do when it ends? What do you mean when it ends? Uh, when the lecture ends? There's no unit 7. Yeah, so I have not posted unit 7 yet because uh, we may or may not be able to get to it. Uh, if we are able to get to it, then you will not have it for this one, but you will have it for the next one. Oh my gosh. All right, you guys need to... Uh, take it easy for a little bit all right i'm trying to read if i'm trying to read the microprocessor is like trying to read so it has to send out a control signal of active for the read output which is zero 
Next, if suppose I want to read from input port number one, then I will also activate my input select one control from the microprocessor. If I do that, and I would also have to make sure that this guy is inactive. So you, you see what happens in this case. Act enabled, enabled, and because of that one, this guy is uh, going to be enabled here, but disabled here, right? So input port number two is not going to be enabled. It's not going to be reading from that. Now let's try to see how this actually uh, reads through. The chip is enabled now, the top chip. All these user inputs are going to YK will equal AK, right? So an 8-bit bus, right? Data bus, least significant data bus, most significant. An 8-bit bus that is connected to the output of this top 74X541 will be able to take user inputs from input port number one and go through and then provide it as an input to the microprocessor, thereby reading from input port number one. And this is uh, an 8-bit bus, right? Now let's try to see what, what all what all do I need to change in order to read from uh, input port number two? And this is this is clearly expandable, right? So you could actually add uh, three, four, five, six, um, 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 more than two clearly. So if I was interested in reading from input port number two into the microprocessor, what would I need to change in terms of signals, control signals that I need to send out from the microprocessor? Does read change or not? No. Does input select one change? Mm, does input select one change? I'm not reading from input port one. I can only read from one port at a time because I'm sharing that bus, right? Yes. So input one, input select one will have to be made one inactive. How, however, Input select two will need to be activated. If you do that, this guy will still be active. This guy will be out. However, both of these will be active. And in that case, you will be able to read the user out inputs coming in eight bit user input from port number two, go through this eight bit data bus into the microprocessor. Right. So you can use this to selectively read from multiple ports by sharing that 8 bit sharing the 8 bit bus one of the applications of this tri state driver questions here Is the diamond thing just a node? Oh, it's just saying this is a bus. One input is going there. One bit is going there. One bit is going there. One bit is going there and so on. So it's uh, indicating that that eight, eight. So when you think about eight bit bus, there are eight wires, right? One of them is going here. One of them is going here. One of them is going here. So it's like a split of uh, one of those. So the diamond symbol is indicating that split or the merger over here. All right, let's see. How do you do it bidirectional? Uh, how do you go one way or the other? Well, we can use a tri-state transmitter receiver or transceiver.
What does the symbol tell us? Well, it tells us that it takes in an 8-bit input, gives out an 8-bit output. All the inputs and outputs are active high. It has one active low enable and it has an input to tell us which direction things should be going. A to B or B to A. So let's try to actually, you know, uh, see based on the uh, schematic, let's try to identify uh, how do you go from A to B versus uh, B to A, right? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to assume that we make things enabled, right? So if I make things enabled, then I'm essentially attaching a zero here. If I attach that to ground, this guy becomes a one. And let's suppose I do this example for direction equals zero. I'm trying to do that for direction equals zero. So if I make this guy zero, uh, there is a zero here, which means there's a zero here, which means there's a zero here, right? But because there is a zero here, this guy will be a one and that is a zero. So this is a one, which means this is a one, right? Now, if you see those two outputs are actually enable inputs to all these tri-state buffers. And because these are active high enables, all these guys are out. These guys are uh, disabled. Let's see, everything over here is disabled. But everything on the other side is enabled, 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 enabled. So if the, if you look at the first case here, B is able to go to A when the direction is zero. So things are moving from right to left in that case, right? So direction equals zero actually means that I'm going from B sub K to A sub K. I'm going from right to left. That's my direction, assuming things are enabled. Of course, if things are disabled, then everything becomes in high impedance, right? That that whole chip is going to be giving an, uh, everything is going to be in high impedance, inputs and outputs. Uh, next, direction equals one. Clearly it should be the other way, right? So let's try to see how that works out. Uh, still enabled, direction we made it one. So this guy still is a zero, this guy becomes a one, but now this will be a one. Uh, zero one so both of them flipped you will get one and a zero so that will be making this a zero so now these guys are enabled in blue but these guys are disabled making the direction a k will go to b k so things moving right when direction is one things moving left when the direction is zero. All right, I think that was uh, the last slide as far as the uh, combinational logic design part one is concerned. I will uh, spend a, one more minute to take your questions and then we can start talking about uh, MUXs.